It's U of L today on 93.9 The Ville. Here's your host, Mark Hebert. And welcome to U of L today with Mark Hebert. We've got a good show, I think, for you for the next 30 minutes or so about the all the great things going on at the University of Louisville. One thing I did want to point out right off the top of the show, we have 14 prestigious Fulbright Scholars at the University of Louisville this year, which ties the record that U of L had set a few years ago, and it will probably put U of L among the top schools in the country for production of Fulbright Scholars, and they'll be going all across the world uh, uh, teaching English and doing research. So that's a really cool thing that has happened at U of L and shows what kind of great students we have at the University of Louisville. All right, coming up on this show a little bit later, if you've got sinus problems, like most people in the Ohio Valley, you'll want to stick around to hear our second guest. He knows a lot about your sinuses, and he's developing a new flexible scope for doing sinus surgery. We're also going to be talking to a U of L group that's starting a music festival, not in Louisville, but in Ghana. We'll hear why they're doing that. But first, U of L's Con Center for Renewable Energy Research is working on several projects to produce cleaner, more efficient energy. The head of the solar manufacturing research is Thad Druffel, who is with us to talk about the cool stuff he's working on, along with one of his students, Brendan Lowry. So, welcome to both of you. Thank you. Hey, thank you. It's Glad you're here. You. All right, Thad, uh, solar research. Tell well, us. Tell us about it. I know you're doing working on a bunch of stuff, but you're working on some solar stuff. So tell us what you're working on. The the what, what I try to tell everybody is I'm here to make it faster, better, cheaper. <laughs> and, and and we're for so, that. We're yeah. in favor of faster, better, cheaper energy. Absolutely. And and, and so uh, what we're trying to do at the University of Louisville, at the Con Center in, in particular, is figure out how how do we make solar more ubiquitous. So you look at you look at the industries out there to, uh, out there today that have had amazing successes, and you look at the print industry, amazing successes. So we're trying to replicate that, but make solar uh, solar energy out of it. So at the the facility I developed at the Con Center, we have a roll to roll manufacturing. Uh, uh, prototyping uh, machine in which we're trying to make solar cells and faster faster cheaper and better right faster better cheaper i mean look at i mean look at every every small city in the united states what do they have they have a printing press so what if we replace every single one of those printing presses with something that prints solar energy that's what i'm trying to figure out i got you all right well brendan what are you doing on this show why why did why did that drag you along Uh, (laughs) you're a student at the university of louisville what are you learning what are you doing uh i'm in chemical engineering and um I'm uh, the grad student underneath uh, Dr. Dreffel, so uh, I do a lot of the, the grunt work in the operation. <laughs> so it's it's good. You're the pack mule for yeah. Thad Dreffel, right? <laughs> Somewhat. Yeah, yeah. he, d- he like does that. the work, yeah. Well, let's talk some specifics, Thad, about um, trying not to get into too technical terms, but what are some of the specific things you're working on uh, to better produce the cheaper solar energy that you're talking about? Well, the hardest thing to, to, to get over is if you look at the way solar cells are made these days, you need high, you need high heat. There's, there's a lot of energy there. So we, we typically, when you think of glass, you t- think of silicon, you're taking those things up to several thousand degrees centigrade. So how do you, how do you replicate those processes on things like paper and plastic? And so that is what uh, the research that Brandon has, has undertaken is, is trying to figure out how do we put nanoparticles down using typical printing processes on paper and plastic and then turn them into bulk materials. And how do you do that? Uh, the, the idea is to um, make your energy source so fast that you can uh, input a large amount of energy, but it's, it's too fast that it actually destroys, um, say, the plastic underneath. So it's it's a snap. I mean, it's less than two milliseconds. A millisecond, yeah. Yeah. Okay. You remember flash uh, flash tubes on on mm-hmm. uh, on on, on uh, cameras, right? People yep. actually used to use. We use the yeah, same. I'm old thing. enough to remember those. Yeah. We use the same thing, but the batteries we use are larger than you are. And are we getting to the point yet where this technology can be used for um, in mass production, uh, or is that what we're trying to get to, so that you can you know heat a whole town? Uh, uh, or drive energy of a car somehow, or, or, or where are we in this in this process? So you're talking uh, solar PV? Uh, I don't know what I'm itself. talking so about. If I'm you, just asking. If you, if you, <laughs> you if guys you, are going to help me with that. Well, if you look at the industry in and of itself, in the last 10 years, there's been a huge explosion. There's there's uh, uh, year over year growth has been over is has been in double digits. There's been exponential growth in in PV. In fact, right now, I believe in PV is what photovoltaics. I'm sorry, yeah, I, 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 solar I'm, cells. Yeah, solar cells. And and almost two percent of the energy in the world is, is made by uh, electricity. Two years ago, that was half a percent. Uh, uh, so every two years, this industry is, the, 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 the amount of, of energy it's produced has grown by a factor of two. 
Wow. And that's not changed. And I don't see that as changing. And, and if you look at the cost of, of energy produced by solar, it's now become a cost pr uh, productive. I was just reading something this morning where down in South America, they've actually been able to get it to about four cents a kilowatt hour. Um, which is on which is on it's on par with traditional uh, uh, means of making uh, energy here in Kentucky it's a little bit higher um, but but we're approaching below the 10 cents a kilowatt hour so that's very exciting for the for the industry it's growing um, but that's a that's a technology as I said is is it, it's a technology that's been around for 60 years they know how to make it it works it's proven but there's still other opportunities and one of the opportunities that we see is how do we make it so it's flexible when you, when you mean flexible, what are you talking so about? So again, well, I'm going back to my printing. Uh, okay. So if you, you you when you when you read your newspaper, which some of us still do, mm -hmm. you can actually fold it this way and that way and not destroy the not destroy the, the the information underneath. Wouldn't that be great if you could do the same thing with your solar cells? So you can imagine when you you just set a car, how many cars that are square do you know of that are on the road? Right. Zero. So what if you can then make the solar cell so it conforms to the shape of the car? So you could bend it over the roof or bend it over the hood or whatever. Exactly. And so now it becomes a designer's dream because they don't have to adapt their designs to something that's square and boxy. They can they can go any, any direction they want to go. And that's what we're working on at the University of Louisville? That is what we're working on at that's the correct. University of Louisville. That's very cool. All right. We're talking with Thad Druffel uh, <coughs> and one of his students, Brandon Lowry from the University of Louisville and the Kahn Center for Renewable Energy Research. Um, what else would you tell folks that you're working on at UofL that's really cool? That I'm working on? Or that you're working uh, on. Well, okay. both of you are working okay, on. Okay, well, I mean, so so we get into the solar, so the, 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 we're talking about a solar cell, but we're also getting into the traditional uh, means of making a solar cell. In fact, we've actually had a, uh, a, a company spin out of the research that was started at the University of Louisville, and that's been in operation for about two years. And it's using the, some, of the, some of the same uh, technology that Brandon's working on that, that utilizes intense pulse light to cure the uh, or to, to melt the the uh, material onto the, onto the solar solar cells. And I saw something else, and I don't I know Thad, you worked on it a little bit about new coal. This was uh, last year, I, I thought. Yes. So tell me a bit a little bit about what new coal is, because I think this is kind of neat. Yeah. So that's a really an interesting opportunity that the Con Center is working on as well with a uh, a company coming out of South Carolina. Um, and and it, the idea is, if you look at the, uh, I'm not sure if a lot of us here in Louisville know what's going on in the Midwest, but we hear about fires. And the, the National Fire Service, they're spending over 50% of their, uh, um, their budget these days just fighting fires. One of the main reasons is the beetle kill. But look at uh, what does fire do? It, it turns out heat, that's the energy. So why can't we go in there and take the trees that have already been destroyed and decimated by the beetles and turn that into useful energy? Well, you can't, you can't transport trees across the nation and, and actually do it economically. So let's take all the energy we can out of the tree locally and then move it around as coal. And that's what we're trying to do at the University of Louisville. Very cool. All right. I've been calling you Brandon Lowry this whole time, and I've got – it's Brandon Lavery, isn't it? That's correct, yeah. So I just, I just can't read my own writing, Brandon. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's all right. Sorry that's all right. about that. Well, Brandon, what have you learned um, – through the, this process, you're a Speed School of Engineering student. What have you learned? Um, well, I, I've learned a lot about the the manufacture of these nanomaterials. You know, these these materials that are so small you, you can't see them with the, the human eye. And and how do we make them better? And um, how how do we learn? You know, what's wrong with these materials if they're so hard to, to see or so hard to, to look at physically? You know, how do we actually interpret what's wrong and how do we improve upon these things? And do you think you want to do this when you get out of school? Is this something you're? Is this the area you're interested in? I'd like to. Uh, I think it's an expanding field, and um, you know we're learning more every day. So I, I think there's some openings in the future. And what would either one of you tell the folks that look at solar energy and say, you know what, this is this is crackpot stuff. It'll never be as cheap as as oil and as uh, cheap as electricity. Um, you know, you talked about it a little bit a minute ago, Thad, but what, what would you tell those folks about, you know, 10 years from now when we look back and say, you know, here's some folks that had real doubts about solar energy. Are you absolutely convinced this is the wave of the future? Oh, uh, there's no doubt I'm convinced that this is the wave of the future. And, and I, I, I go back, two things I'd go back to is, is first of all, where did coal come from? Right. Mm -hmm. It originally right. originates from the sun, yeah. correct? Oh, that's true. That's and true. and so look at what the amount of energy that the sun provides us, and and we really should be able to tap into that. And you go back to to what uh, uh, our hometown hero Thomas Edison said: if you're not using the sun a hundred years from now, if you're still relying on on coal, 
you know, shame on us. And so I think that we've, we, and it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, and what I'm really excited about, I've been around for, for well over a quarter of a century. And I'm starting to see that we're not, this is no longer a political discussion. This is an actual economic discussion. And that really excites me because that means that, that, that we're taking this seriously. Uh, um, and there's some, some very serious opportunities. And if you look at the cost of, of producing solar, it's come down tremendously, 80% in, in about five years. Very good. Thad Druffel from Speed School of Engineering and the Con Center for Renewable Energy Research, and Brandon Lavery, not Lowry, <laughs> a student at the University of Louisville. Thanks for being on the show. Appreciate it. Sitting in front of me is Dr. Tom Higgins. He's a U of L Medical School graduate who's now on the faculty of the med school, and he's an ear, nose, and throat doctor who specializes in in sinus problems and it's called rhino what's it called rhinology rhinology of course it is all right well dr (laughs) higgins welcome to the program appreciate you being on well thanks for having me mark well the reason i asked you on is because at at kind of a shark tank event where you uh, that uh, folks from u of l kind of pitched their products and the discoveries that they were working on to a group i saw yours and you are working on a uh, scope uh, that can help do sinus surgery in some people. So why don't you describe what you're working on? Yes. Uh, so we use scopes all the time in, in sinus surgery now, and we've developed them over the years, especially since the 1980s, to, to do minimally invasive sinus surgery. But we've come to find out that there's certain times that it is difficult to migrate or navigate through the corridors of the sinuses. And sometimes we need to do surgery where I'm looking for ways that we can actually avoid surgery. And so the uh, the product that we're and the and the product the product that we're developing is a uh, type of scope that will allow us to better navigate the sinuses to possibly prevent surgery uh, and uh, but also make it easier to navigate the sciences during surgery and make some things that have uh, been a, uh, very difficult to do make them much easier. And tough places to reach in because right. right now if I need sinus surgery it's either a really hard scope, yes. metal scope, right, that you're sticking up my nose basically, right? right. Or what? what? What's the alternative? Or there, there's a flexible scope which we can look at pathology, but we can't really do anything with it because it's too flexible. Too flexible. And so if we can put the two together to allow uh, some flexibility, but also rigid enough to allow a surgeon to actually operate, we can do surgeries that so far are very difficult to do um, and uh, require uh, general anesthesia or, or right. extensive surgery. But this could get to places perhaps that these other scopes couldn't get to. Um, right. Like I think you described it when, when I, the Shark Tank event that I was talking about, it, like under the eyes um, in, in some of those areas, correct? Right. For instance, uh, in particular, the, the maxillary sinus, which is the cheek sinus, uh, sometimes there can be, say, a cyst within that sinus. And it's really hard to get to right now uh, because you have to basically remove some tissue to get to that area to see if that, that that cyst is just a cyst, infection, possibly tumor. Uh, so the idea with, with this um, um, scope is to be able to actually get into the sinus and possibly uh, be able to manage it and identify or get a biopsy without having to resort to surgery. We're talking with Dr. Tom Higgins, who is developing a scope, some a new type of scope to work on uh, sinus problems, and he's a rhinologist uh, who mm-hmm. works on uh, uh, sinus problems, ear, nose, and throat uh, specialist. So you are working on this with someone from the Speed School of Engineering at the University of Louisville, correct? Correct. Working on it with Scott Cameron, who's a faculty with uh, bioengineering. Uh, and uh, we are uh, obviously we need both of our expertise to kind of figure out the uh, um, well the engineers uh, the make in, it work right right <laughs> it, it's very it, right? it's a it's a very intricate system to to make something like this work and I I'm assuming it has a, a little camera on the end of it doesn't it the screen? right right so you know what the heck you're doing. Once right, you exactly. There. You need to see, and then you have to be able to get uh, instruments to actually um, um, do what you need to do. Right. Okay. Well, let's talk in general then about sinus problems. You know, everybody I think that lives in the Ohio Valley claims, uh, well, you, you you got sinus problems, uh, you got asthma, you got all these things just because of all the pollen and all the stuff in the air. So how bad is 
are the sinus problems or are they just allergies that everybody gets? Well, it can be a combination. In Louisville, Kentucky, it is uh, probably one of the worst places for sinus and allergy problems. And the hallmark of both of them is basically inflammation or swelling within the sinus or nose cavities. Allergies is one reason for the inflammation. Infection can be another reason, and there can just irritants in general can cause uh, this uh, this cascade, if you will, of of uh, swelling. Now, when it starts, it could just be allergies, which a lot of times can be just in the nose. But if the swelling starts to get into the sinus cavities, which are around the, the, the nose, uh, particularly from an infection or what have you, or even developing what's called polyps, then uh, it becomes what's called sinusitis, which is inflammation around the sinus cavities. At that point, your typical nasal sprays and allergy medicines don't seem to work. Uh, and, and you have to now uh, uh, um, f- figure out something else that, that can help to get around those corridors and um, uh, relieve the sinusitis, not just the uh, another term for your rhinitis, so inflammation of the nose, which is more the allergies. So that's when people come pick up the phone and call you, right? Right. <laughs> and come right. see you. How do I know? How do I know um, when I cross over that line between just having real bad allergy problems and runny nose and stuff going on and, I, and I've got sinusitis? Is that how you say it? Yes. And how do I know that I've gotten to that point and I need to go see a doctor? Well, um, it, it, is, it can be quite difficult. One is uh, treating the allergies as best you can or, or best an allergist can. And when it doesn't seem to be uh, – uh, enough, then we, we start considering sinusitis. But there are some hallmarks of sinusitis. So with sinusitis, you're, you're more likely to have a lot of pressure, um, sometimes pain, of, of, the, of the face. You're more likely to have a more post-nasal drainage or so drainage in the back of the throat or even uh, what's called purulent drainage, which is thick drainage as opposed to the the, the clear liquid of uh, allergic uh, rhinitis. Uh, two other hallmarks are, are smelling loss. If you start to have problems with smell, that's more likely sinusitis and allergies. And also congestion in the nose uh, can, can, uh, can overlap, but uh, uh, be, a, be a sign of sinusitis. All right. Well, let's take this uh, conversation full circle and wrap it up here. What, uh, when do you expect your um, device that you're putting together to be on the market? I'm assuming you're still doing testing on it, correct? Yes, we're still doing testing. Uh, I think we have some fine tuning to do. And so there, there's probably, uh, we, we definitely have a, a few years ahead of us uh, to, to really get it to market. Um, um, especially any medical product, you have to do extensive testing and, that, and that's the appropriate thing to do to make sure it's safe for patients and, uh, and uh, the best product available. And if people want to track you down, if they got a question either about the device or <laughs> about their, uh, their nose problems, what they may or may not have, how do they track you down that way? Well, the easiest way uh, is to, to go online and, and uh, you can search Higgins-Sinus.com uh, or you can do, uh, find my name on Google and you can find me that way. All right. And congratulations on graduating from UofL. We're glad you're a card. That's, that, that's a good thing. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you very much. All right. Dr. Tom Higgins from the UofL Medical School and who's working on a new product, as you just heard, and can also help you with your sinus problems if you've got some. With me, Stephen Mattingly, who's an assistant professor of guitar at the UofL School of Music. And he's here with Jordan Taylor, also from the School of Music. And they here, are here to talk about a pet project. So welcome to both of you, first off. Thank you. Thanks for having us. All right, Stephen, tell us, what's this uh, pet project you got going on at the School of Music? Well, I'm really proud of the work my grad student, Jordan Taylor, has done on this project. He was uh, raised in Ghana as a, as a child. He got to know the culture really well. And as uh, things turned out, Jordan was looking for graduate programs in guitar and ended up here in Louisville, which is the sister city to Tamale, Ghana, and is kind of considered the sister city for the entire nation. And uh, Jordan took it upon himself to start a music festival, the first of its kind, a classical music festival, which will run later this summer in July. And he has started a program in collaboration with the University of Louisville and uh, the Ghana National Symphony and the University of Ghana and has a website, the Ghana National Music Festival dot com. And uh, you can learn more about it there. So, Jordan, you're a student. 
I, I was a student. Was a student. So now just you're a graduate. graduate. UofL graduate. That's right. I know. So are you back in Ghana now or are you staying in Louisville? I'm staying in Louisville. Based out of Louisville, yes, sir. And why did you decide to do this? Why did you decide to come up with the, the idea of this music festival in Ghana? Well, it's it's always been uh, a dream of mine to uh, to combine my heritage in Ghana with my current passion of music. And this just kind of turned out to be the catalyst for that. And I think it's a it's a great thing. It's a need in Ghana to promote classical music in 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 Ghana's youth and the professional professional world, um, I've been very encouraged by Dr. Maddie Lee and, and other members of the U of L School of Music, and so it just tr- it turned out to be a really great opportunity to, to do to do this. The the Ghanaian side, everybody over there was completely welcoming and encouraging for, of of it, and they just they have this desire to promote classical music within their own country, and I and I would love to be a part of that. When did you come to uh, the United States? We moved back to the States in 2006. Okay, and so your parents were there for some reason, right, in Ghana? Right, right. We were missionaries over there, and and we were there from 93 to 2006, came back and moved to Texas, actually. Okay, and then you wound up at the University of Louisville, how? Uh, Graduate studies. I wanted to study with Dr. Mattingly, and he had an opening, and it it worked out perfectly. So uh, did you uh, major in guitar, or uh, what's your specialty? Uh, It was guitar, music performance with an emphasis in classical guitar. Okay, and so what was it? How was he as a student? Obviously, he's a guy that can put some stuff together. But how was he as a student? <laughs> Absolutely, he was, he was a phenomenal student. And what we're looking for in our graduate students, particularly those who are going to be graduate teaching assistants, are those who are self motivated and connectors in a way. And you have certain personalities that can uh, not only foster uh, great education for themselves and the way they learn, but also energize their peers to, to learn and become better students and better leaders. And uh, Jordan definitely has those skills and spades, and he has uh, used his entrepreneurial spirit in the best possible sense of the word, um, and he's done something that is going to contribute to the greater good and will have a lasting impact beyond this summer music festival. We're talking with Stephen Manningly, who's an assistant professor of guitar at the U of L School of Music, and Jordan Taylor, who's a U of L grad, and he's putting together a music festival, a classical music festival in Ghana. Uh, tell us where Ghana is. Where is that? Ghana is on the west coast of Africa, uh, bordered by Togo and Ivory Coast. And the normal music the, the, that you'd normally hear in Ghana is what? Is it a mixed bag, or do they have a lot of classical music? It is a mixed bag, and, and, and no, they don't have a lot of classical music yet. It is, it is booming. It's growing with the National Symphony Orchestra and now the Accra Symphony Orchestra really taking, taking a hold of the classical music scene and trying to promote that within that, that particular city. Uh, their, their musical culture is very traditional in, in, in that they... Uh, they promote their traditional instruments, like the djembe, percussive, percussive instruments, but they also have the new high life uh, style or palm, palm wine music style, which is their traditional kind of pop style. Okay. And, and that's so got a little bit of everything. Right, a little bit of everything. Little do they hear everything. American music on the radio in Ghana? Uh, yes, they do. Nowadays, they do. Uh, they didn't have access to that uh, while I was there, but since I've, I've been gone, that scene has definitely grown. Worldwide. It's yeah. the web, baby. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, is, right. it is. It is. The web. Yeah. That's right. And Stephen, what? How will this benefit the University of Louisville in your mind, having a, a former student go out and, and put this all together to have this thing in Ghana? Well, something that I, I believe is a, a core of our mission and the initiatives of the university is for education to happen beyond the campus here in, in Louisville. And this is going to be a learning experience for our students beyond the four walls of the classroom and the whiteboard, in which I could use to teach. And I think in the very best possible sense of education in the 21st century, we're moving beyond the classroom and we're moving beyond the timeline of a semester. So I believe the University of Louisville will benefit from this and the collaboration that we're founding, really. Uh, It's the first collaboration of its sort between the School of Music and Ghana. Uh, The university already has a, a tradition of support for projects in Ghana with Tamale and the Roberson Fund has generously supported this with grants to fund the expenses that we will have myself and then our other graduate students who are traveling with us. So this music festival is all paid for pretty much or not or are you still working on it? We're still working on that and that's one of the things that that Jordan wanted to speak about today was that um, there there is a need for uh, funding. We have private donors and uh, grants like the Roberson Fund 
that have given, and there's about a uh, $3,000 um, expense that we're trying to, to make up for uh, through a variety of sources. And uh, Jordan is organizing an event in June that will uh, help support that. And what we're looking to do is to provide uh, free education to all of the students who will participate in Ghana. So that has an expense associated with it, along with um, the meals that we hope to provide for them. All right. Well, Jordan, you want to talk about that event a little bit? And then I've got a, one more question for you. But sure. Go ahead talk about that event that sure. you're trying to put together to raise some money. Not a problem. So this fundraising event will be held tentatively on June 8th at St. Paul United Methodist Church in Bardstown Road. It's going to be a uh, dinner catering a traditional West African meal, uh, it, uh, including performances from all the American guest artists that are attending, as well as lectures and presentations by us of what we hope to do while we're there, presenting a need that they have in Ghana, why this is important, as well as uh, two messages from the director of the University of Ghana Department of Music as, and the director of the National Symphony Orchestra there. And then it'll be, it'll be finalized with a, a question and answer session between the attendees and then and the uh, the guest artists going. And just get a hold of the School of Music, I guess. The, uh, the best way would probably be to go to GhanaNationalMusicFestival.com mm -hmm. to find out more information on that and the upcoming Kickstarter campaign that, that Jordan will launch. And if anyone can't make that particular June 8th event, they can always uh, send donations to me at the University of Louisville School of Music, and they can make those donations through the Louisville Guitar Society which is helping with this as a 501c3 charitable organization, those donations would be tax deductible. But Ghana National Music Festival, the website sounds like the place to go for That is the right place All to right. go. Mm -hmm. uh, one last question. Of the students who are going from the University of Louisville, the grad students, what will they be doing when they get to Ghana? All these other students, not just you know, former student Jordan right. over here, but what are, what do right. you plan to have the, those U of L students doing? Well, Jordan has come up with the curriculum over there, and we'll all be uh, teaching in some capacity and performing. So there will be uh, nightly performances, uh, collaborative performances between the students and the teachers. So there'll be um, lecturing, uh, coaching ensembles, teaching private lessons, and performing. All right, very good. Anything else you want to add? Because uh, we need to wrap this up, but uh, I look, look forward to hearing them. I, I'd just like to say thanks again for having us, and we'd love to hear from the audience about yep. any ideas they have and ways that they can uh, be a part of this this event. All right, that's Stephen Mattingly. He's an assistant professor of guitar at the U of L School of Music, and Jordan Taylor, the grad student who's putting together a music festival in Ghana. Good job, gentlemen. Hope Thank to hear you. a little bit more about it. All Thank right. You. So before we wrap the show up, we always try to do a did you know segment, a little tidbit about the University of Louisville. You know, we just finished up Derby Week, and UofL is helping the backside workers at Churchill Downs, as we do every summer. UofL's School of Nursing manages the Kentucky Racing Health Services Center, which provides care to backside workers, including in-house mental health services. The clinic is directed by staff from the nursing school, and students treat patients under supervision. So that's what we've got going on at the backside of Churchill Downs from the University of Louisville. You can find the podcast of all of these programs at soundcloud.com. The video versions of many of these UofL Today programs with Mark Hebert can be seen on Metro TV, KET3, and on UofL's YouTube channel. And join me every Monday morning with Terry Miners and Rachel Platt on Great Day Live on WHAS-TV, where I always have a new story about something interesting going on at the University of Louisville. Thank you all for listening to UofL Today with Mark Hebert. Go Cards!